Welcome to the Mill Valley Film Festival. It's a great opportunity we have here to talk with filmmaker Rob Nielsen, the director of Center Divide, which is in the Mill Valley Film Festival. And Rob is known as leading American filmmaker. He is a poet and painter, as well as a very prolific filmmaker. He, um, among his many awards, are ones that are, I, I believe this pair is unique to any filmmaker. In um, 1979, his first feature, Northern Lights, which he directed with John Hansen, received the Camera d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival. And also in 1988, his film Heat and Sunlight won the Grand Jury Prize at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, and uh, I, I could name a, a number of other films, but you have too many, I think, to keep track of. No, no, no. Those two are but, enough. But, uh, but uh, welcome again, once again, to the New Valley Film Festival. You've been in the festival many times. Um, and I, we're here to talk about Center Divide, which is the second film, I understand, in uh, a trilogy, an intended trilogy called the Nomad Trilogy. Correct. Uh, would you like to explain a bit what the Nomad Trilogy is? Well, it's, it's uh, first of all, it starts with my workshop, the Citizen Cinema Workshop, and my uh, players workshops I've, I've held around the world. And, and uh, particularly, this group I thought was special, but I don't know what the films are going to be when I when I open the up, open up the doors and then come the people. So we invented the Nomad trilogy out of the people that were there, not the other way around. That I had the Nomad trilogy and then I tried to cast it, which is my usual method. So what it is, it's some homeless and and uh, marginalized people in the Bay Area, some in a homeless encampment, uh, decide. Or it's decided for them. There's a kind of a call for eminent domain because they're going to tear down the racetrack and build condos, and they need to get rid of the homeless encampments. And so, so out of necessity, and also out of getting being tired of the credit card culture that leaves them behind, they decide to leave. And so that's the the and and the, the major thread of the of the story is a couple of lovers on a motorcycle. Uh, going north, there's no more west to escape to. Going north to try to find the father he never knew, and that's in that. There's also a group of uh, wildcat um, uh, carpenters and a stowaway that are in a pickup truck, and they're all friends, and they're all going east. So that's the first film, arid cut. Second film, Center Divide, which is the road movie. They're they're on the way uh, east, and the people that they meet and the experiences they have looking for arid cut, which is the spot where the father that uh, that uh, rail rail the character, the father his father is supposed to be, and um, his name is supposedly Bert Neville. So they go through the countryside looking for Bert Neville and looking for for. Uh, for arid cut and the adventures they have with people they find along the way, and then and their own uh, relationships between in between the groups and as friends. That's the second film, and then the third film is what happens once the once they get where they're going, which turns out to be uh, deep in the desert uh, in um, uh, in Nevada and Northern California, and a couple of ranches that they uh, that they find. So that, that film is now in production. We've shot three days on that. We'll be finishing that hopefully uh, in November. So in a way, the, the, you, do you not know how the, the, the trilogy will end because you're working with the workshops? Yes, that, that's true. And I don't really know in many cases what any given scene is going to be. We, we know where we are. We know who we are. And we know the, the experiences that we've had in backstory improvisations in the workshop. And also, we know what we did in, in Arid Cut. But exactly what's going to happen is part of the thrill of this. And it's part of the talent of the group that I've, that I've, uh, that I've been lucky enough to find 
that they'll surprise you every time and come up with things that, you know, they, they seem quite smart and wow, aren't I smart to have thought of that? But no, I didn't think about it. I thought about a lot of ways maybe to encourage an encounter. And I, you know, I, I put my finger up and I hope the lightning strikes. <laughs> <laughs> now this is, uh, first of all, it, it, this film is totally unusual for me among your films, because I, I don't think you do, you've done so many road pictures, have you? Um, I don't, I don't recall that I, that I have, I've made almost 50 now. There must have been yeah. some on the road, but I think you're right. I think you're right, Richard. I think this is a, this is a, the, maybe the first that was so specifically out there on the road with the, the adventures with the people in the movie, but then the people we find. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the beauty and the naturalness of their ability to fit into our, our, uh, our cast here is really another one of the things that thrills me about filming this way. Yeah, so it, in terms of the, uh, uh, what you capture, you have people appearing, you know, the people you run into along the road, I guess, Right. But you absorb them into the story. You find ways to actually integrate them. Yeah, that's right. I mean, they they know uh, th these are people that we meet largely through our Modoc County um, producer Gene Billardu, who, who for most for the most part, although not entirely, uh, found people once she she also writes for the Modoc record up there and is is uh, is a is a photographer and an artist in her own right. So. She's helped us meet all of all so many interesting people up near the Alturas and Cedarville area, and another case in Lassen County. Um, there's a there's a a bar there called the BV Roundup where I met a lot of a lot of interesting folks that fit in. So they know basically what's going on, but they don't really even know exactly how they're going to find a way to relate to it. They simply find it in the shooting. We we have we shoot we're shooting two uh, handheld uh, um, eleven iPhones, so wow. everybody's moving. The the cameras have to stay out of each other's way. The sound has to stay out of everybody's way, and they in this atmosphere of invention come up with with things that mostly I I couldn't have imagined. But sometimes I'll throw in the. Uh, a kind of a thought that I had once I get to know them a little bit about what if you start from this position? What if you, but all of them are who they purport to be, except that Jean Billadou is, uh, plays the aunt of one of our main characters is played by Emily Corbo. That's the lover of, of uh, Rail. So it's Rail and Mitra. She plays the aunt, but she's not the aunt. So, so there, there are, there, it's fiction and documentary and inspiration and, God knows what, somehow finding a home. And then, of course, it all has to be edited. And the editing, too, is the final arbiter, the, the shapes and, and sizes, and everything is, is, is figured out later on. But we shoot a lot, and we shoot quickly, and we don't spend a whole lot of time lighting. In fact, we, I don't think we shot, we did any lighting in this film. And because we've, we're there to try to promote the, the relaxation and the camaraderie that will allow everyone to fit together uh, in the ways that you've seen. It's amazing. So the entire film was shot with two iPhones. Yes, with two handheld iPhones. We only used, I wonder if you could guess which, uh, which shot we used a, a tripod for. You probably, you probably, you probably <laughs> wouldn't have come immediate. I'll tell you what it is. There's there's a place where he opens the he opens his truck truck the uh, hood, and and the steam blows out at him, because the engine shot and and the and the thing is boiling over, so we had to put the steam in. We're not going to have yeah. him. So we needed a tripod for that. That's the yeah. only shot. <laughs> that's a, that's amazing. Can you talk a little bit more about your use of improvisation? I know that you. Uh, one of your models, one of your, your main models for filmmaking um, was the films of John Cassavetes. 
Correct. Uh, yeah. Especially, you know, his first feature, Shadows. And he worked, he improvised a lot of it. How, how does it work for you? Improvisation. Well, in turn, yeah, John John improvised the first the first version, and then he wrote the second version, and then I'm sure he improvised from the second version back to the first version or whatever. Um, I I when when I first saw that film, I thought, oh, that, as you've heard me say before, film can be about you and me. It, it, it doesn't it doesn't need the the uh, the the in, intervention in, interventionary. Uh, system of screenplays and table readings and and uh, improv and um, uh, memorized dialogue and all that stuff. It can happen out of the the um, the the raw encounter, and and that's what I'm looking for is the raw encounter. But also for me in my workshop, it's all about emotion, because I feel if people can really go to the, the depths of joy, rage despair, intimacy, if they can find the way in, then they can do almost everything else. Maybe they can't do a written dialogue. That's a whole other skill. And I don't pretend, that I, that I, mean, I, I don't use that generally, but um, it's to make people uh, uh, flexible emotionally and in their own skins and, and feeling uh, well, whatever. I, you could use the word powerful, but there's a, there's a lot of cliches you could use. But it's really pretty operational and pretty pretty straightforward when you get down to it. It's just allowing for people to be triumphantly themselves. Do you ever uh, do you ever come up with a, a finished script, or is it always in process? Um, uh, uh, in this particular case, I wrote some things, some, um, and then I but then I never. Uh, it, it was it was rare. The one one scene was the one where where Dane uh, tells the story about Captain Jack. Uh, I I wrote that out and I gave it to him and he ran it through his system and it came out the way he wanted it to be. Uh, and because you know in the past, as you know, I have written screenplays and worked from them, but the more I did it, the less because my hunger is always for for the. Um, the the thing that that doesn't need the intervention that comes out raw and and unshaped uh, from a human standpoint that's what thrills me and almost all the time with the exception of Cassavetes and others I mean Satyajit Ray did pretty good and I don't think he was all about lines but but uh, to some extent he probably was but and but what about Atanarwa uh, fast runner I think those did those people have lines I don't know do you. Can you I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, it doesn't matter because it, if it feels like it just happened and if it feels human level, I'm just not interested in actor level, even with great actors so you would, where you, that you have to applaud for how brilliant they are. So often I still don't feel that, that, that I'm that just that ground level thing that makes you relax. Like I relaxed in shadows for the first time and I said, oh, OK. That could be done, and so, and I got to know John, and and John John saw some of the films I did that way, like um, I, I, I uh, Signal Seven was I, uh, I uh, what did I do? I, I put his name at the end, saying thanks a lot, and he was uh, and he was very happy with that film, and he and I loved what he said. He said that um, that uh, hey Rob Rob, uh, Jen and I saw your film. We saw your film last night, and. We never agree on anything, and and we loved it. We we loved it. We loved it, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> that was that was like one of the great moments in my life. Do you ever find yourself wanting to steer the improvisations in a certain direction because you want to you want the the film to end at a certain point? And do you well that kind of shaping? Yeah, the shaping is there in 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 um, what would you say outline form. I know what every scene is is generally gonna do to to justify the next one, and I know kind of how it's gonna end. But I'm still struggling with that on the third film. So when you said you don't know, well, I don't know a lot, but I generally know. Um, well, I, I use I always know from a 
from an, from, the, from an outline standpoint where we're going and where we are. Uh, although sometimes because of what the players do and because of what happens in, in, a, in a given day, that can change. But it's more the, the inner mechanisms of the scenes that I don't want to mess with because the people will do it better because I cast them for what they are, not for what I want them to be. Um, when I started in the workshop, I didn't know who was going to be anybody. But as we played and worked on worked in backstory improv, well, backstory improvisation happens once we've set up who the characters are. But I didn't know the characters until we did lots of workshop exercises, and then they it became like magic. Oh, I could see it. Here's here's a love. Here's a here's somebody that's going to be the lover of this person. Although that's not the case in with with Mitra and and Rail because I had a casting session to find Mitra. I didn't have a Mitra in the workshop. Anyway, it happens. So it's all organic, and who knows exactly how it'll happen, or even whether ever will ever have ten dollars to make the movie. So um, it's kind of a whirlwind of expectation and desire, and uh, and hopefully uh, we get we get the breaks. So I, I I know that a word that I've seen you use in different circumstances is epic, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate what you mean as as what is epic well um yeah in this case uh, it's about it's an article that i wrote about epic digital uh, no budget films and by by that i meant it doesn't just have to be in a little room with two people and and that can be wonderful i'm not saying that but when you go out into the world and you go out and the world is your canvas and you're traveling in the in the in the desert and you're traveling in the forest and you're traveling in the mountains, and there's there's an epic feeling, I believe, that of of nature or n nature um, d defining uh, a lot of what happens, and that epicness in cinema is generally paid for with enormous amounts of, of millions of dollars and enormous numbers of of uh, paid paid artists that to, to from from every department, but I'm saying it's out there. And you can go there and do it. Sometimes you're going to go into a national forest. Oh, gee, well, you're supposed to have a permit. Well, you know, I, 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 I forgot to. I forgot my permit. And I'm going to be gone in a half an hour. But, of course, nobody's there. I believe that a filmmaker has the right to go out like a, like a photographer or like a, a poet and go where they're not hurting anybody. They're not... They're not um, uh, assuming anything, if, if you're asked to stop, you say sorry. Uh, but I think all of this enables one could, to be epic simply because the sun rises and goes down, and that's free. And a lot of the places where you are, you're just passing through. I, you know, as I said in that article one time, I just we were in the we were in Chinatown and and uh, with three with two actors and a, a camera and me and. And it sound, and we just there was a, there was a table in a in a restaurant, and it, it was outside. It was a little little bar. Sat down. We just did a little scene impromptu, and the and the owner came out and he said, uh, "When's the film coming out?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, now sometimes they say, "What the hell are you doing?" You out, and of course I'm out. I have no argument. I'm not saying what I'm doing is legal. All I'm saying is that in some in some philosophical existential way, it's right to go out into the world and see who wants to play, and if they don't want to play, please be be uh, be considerate. Don't don't push yourself on anybody. And I try I try to do it that way. That that's that's epic to me. Yes. So so there are a, a number of uh, moments in the film where um, there are. Uh, even though the movie is overall in black and white, there are little color patches in the film where moments right. where a pat part of the sky is color, or so it, it just it's very selective. And I'm wondering if you comment on that. Yeah, well, some, for example, we did it one time in a lodge where we were staying uh, up uh, up in Mammoth Mammoth Lakes. And the light, the light was such, it was a very dark place. And when we shot, we realized, you know, we can get a little help with a little color because color will fit, 
if, if, if gray is too close to the black that is, is predominant in a given scene, if you inject a little color, the thing opens up a little bit. And so that we, we did that because somehow it was better than spending hours lighting it. We didn't have any lights anyway. We, did, we went, I don't believe in lights. Well, I believe in lights I can hold in my hand and then put on, the, put it on a little stand or I have a whole bunch of little lights that uh, they clip on to some, they're really bright too. And they clip on to your, well, you have to clip them on somewhere and you have to mute them a little bit. So partly that. Partly also, hey, I didn't like the black and white in this one. Well, why is that? I thought it would be perfect. Uh, there, there's one in where Jean Billadou, the aunt to Mitra, is talking about her story about the courtroom. And I thought it looked beautiful with the checker uh, board ceiling. And when I, when I saw it later, I said, no, well, why? And I couldn't figure out why. I thought, I think it, I thought it felt too crude. So it's, it's situational. And another, in another situation, at the end of the film, when they've gone through with all their adventures and snake bites and all of that stuff, as they round the last corner to go across the desert to still looking for Bert Neville and, and Arid Cut, if you look carefully, you'll, it's black and white, and it rounds a corner, and you'll see that the sun suddenly becomes slight, comes slightly pink. It opens up and closes. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea. It just yeah. was something that I felt, you know, had had some resonance that it, it, you, it isn't about re meaning. It's it's about feeling. So, yeah, so I use it in a variety of ways. That's very interesting. Uh, well, we're, we're running low on time. I don't know okay. if there's anything you want to add about... Um... You know, one, one thing I would add is thank, thank God for Mill Valley and, uh, you know, because of you and Mark and Zoe and everybody and uh, Yvonne and, and um, everybody who I can't mention again, I just want to say that, that uh, I, I've lived around here. I've been, ex you know, is, is the poet accepted in his town? Well, it's, isn't the, isn't the, isn't the uh, saying go that he's not? That a poet is not accepted in his own time or place? I've been accepted in my, in my home Place. I'm so grateful to Mill Valley for always being there for the various experiments I've tried over these 30 years, you know. So I want to say that. And I want to say that my belief is in real people, whether they're actors or whether they're peddlers or, or whether they're axe murderers or whatever they are. I, I believe that the cinema, I've seen all, all what the cinema can do. I'm sure that there's more that will be found in, in the cinema that exists in, in, in any space that you want it at any time. But um, the, human, the human thing, Bergman says that the, that the great subject of cinema is the human face. And I would just expand that to say the great subject is the human, uh, is the human animal. By, from the savage to the tender and all of that, that's what interests me. And I, don't, I, I think that it's found everywhere. And the beauty, the beauty of nature is everywhere. And so I've been lucky to be able to follow that urge and have a place to show it in the end as a Mill Valley Festival. So it's terrific. It's terrific to have you. And uh, uh, I think uh, we're, we're all looking forward to seeing your next 50 films. <laughs> you think I'm up to it? Another 50? Of course, of course. <laughs> thank you very much, Rob Nielsen. You bet. Th thank you, Richard. Pl pleasure to uh, to be talking with you. Thank you.